Hey, tribe of journeymen and women. So today I decided to sit down together with you and obviously have this cup of coffee. So join me with the coffee if you like it. And talk to you about uh, a bit about my story and a bit about what this channel is aiming to be. So you could say that this is going to be a trailer and I will be addressing some of the subjects as if for people who do not know me. Uh, like for, for people who just jumped in and they're curious, they saw, you know, you saw one video or two videos and like, oh, who's his, who is this guy? And, and I'm going to put this video on, you know, the trailer part of the channel. So you could watch this and kind of get to know me, what I'm about and what this channel is about uh, and jump into the story right away. Uh, but also if you do know me from uh, some of the other journeys that are already public and, you know, or you know me personally, I will be uh, doing my best to not only kind of satisfy the new people but also if if you're already on going on along this journey uh, i will do my best to also clarify some of the intentions of this channel and share some valuable unique lessons that i learned through this journey so that uh, you could also kind of become more in sync with what's happening here and uh, so it's 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 not going to be a waste even if you are uh, you know, kind of the general outline of things. This is going to be a recap, but also I, I'll add some new things. So just kind of, as long as you're interested and you're not bored listening to this, then, you know, just stick with me. Uh, now, the first segment I'm intending to introduce, a kind of a quick re recap of my story of how things got to here. And <clears throat> the main kind of most important aspects of my life that happened is, well, first of all, Ever since I was little, I always felt that I want to have a positive impact on others. Uh, and it's I'm kind of grateful for that quality, that inherent quality, I guess. You know, I was a, actually when I was a child, when I was little, I was a timid, shy kid, which is like, oh, who's shy now? <laughs> I do get shy sometimes, but Obviously, a lot of change happened, <clears throat> but me and my brother, whom I actually like to show, you know, this is a picture of me and him. I'm on the left. <clears throat> so me and my brother, we, uh, uh, he's four years older than me, three and a half. And he was the kid who was, you know, all over the place, active, outspoken. And I guess as it's kind of usual for brothers, you know, to choose different roles, uh, I think it's common that brothers usually are very distinct. Uh, my brother was, uh, I, I'm sorry, I was uh, the shy, timid kid, and I was kind of very thoughtful, very imaginative. And I spent a lot of time just kind of playing with myself, playing with my imaginary friends. I, I actually had imaginary friends for a while, and uh, <laughs> so I told you this is going to be some new news, uh, so... I remember I had uh, my imaginary friends with Spider-Man. I used to adore Spider-Man when I was uh, small. Then uh, there was Venom, his, one of his arch en en enemies, which is kind of good and bad. You know, he's in between, but I kind of liked the, the power behind him. Uh, then I had Wolverine, uh, which I fell in love with while watching the X-Men animated series. And also I had, actually, surprisingly, uh, the Batman of the future. Uh, I can't remember, Tim McGinnis, I think. Anyway, he's, I watched his cartoon, The Modern One, which followed the Batman animated series, where he is, uh, you know, a young Batman to become Batman. And, and I guess I kind of identified more with him. I wasn't in love with Batman at that day. Uh, but those four were my imaginary friends with whom I spent quite some time. And uh, I, uh, I think I let go of them quite late. I think I kind of still gently sometimes reach out to them or talk to them and discuss things and kind of took them as my mentors for quite a while. Uh, not to say though that I did not have friends. Uh, in my childhood, I did have a bunch of friends. Uh, like, you know, I would play in the, in, in the yard together with a bunch of other kids. And, and interestingly enough, like while I was shy, especially at school in the first few years, at the same time, uh, in the in the in the you know outside of the house, which kids used to play outside of the house, <laughs> not anymore, I guess. Uh, interestingly enough, I was kind of the leader because my my imagination was so kind of more developed, I guess, than my friends. That whenever we would play imaginary games, that what would you that's what you would do in the past because we didn't have like these crazy video games you have these days. 
so that I would be the one responsible to be the one to create the storyline and then we would get into it and and yeah I kind of took the leadership role many times but kind of what I'm aiming to say in the, in this storyline is that uh, I uh, I was always very sensitive and thoughtful and imaginative and I think that part of that led me to being also empathetic which uh, I don't know if anybody knows that word. It's in Lithuanian, in my language, it's a common word. But when you feel for others, when you know if somebody uh, hurts their finger and you're like, ah, it hurts you. I was very, I had a very strong sense of that. And when I reflect back into my life, I, I actually consider that I'm very grateful I had this quality because I would feel for people and I would care for them. Like, <laughs> I imagine, I, I remember there's this... Uh, piece of paper like a notebook from my first year in school or second year in school where we were encouraged to write some stuff and uh, it's a long story so I'll go short but uh, part of the, there was a question so what do you want to do uh, like what's what do you want to do in life or something like that you know and most people wrote like I want to be an astronaut or whatever you know president that stuff but I think I from what I remember I wrote that I would like to eliminate poverty from the world and and kind of make sure that all homeless people would have a home something like that so it shows that i was very caring and, and kind of thoughtful from early on uh, and interestingly enough i think that kind of always stayed now not to say that um that that part of me was always as present uh, especially during the last few years um i will come come to that i'm pre i presume but uh, especially for the last few years, I burnt myself a lot. You know, I got hurt in many different ways. One of them was, uh, which is covered in a, in a video, it's the, I, how most of my Aikido students abandoned me. And then when I opened up the Martial Arts Journey YouTube channel, my main channel uh, now has over 125,000 subscribers as I'm recording this. Uh, you know, I kind of went into war with some parts of the martial arts and, and a lot of people hated me and criticized me and, and so I think all of that kind of dimmed down my, my natural inherent quality of caring for people. I think it was always there, but when you get hurt, I think you kind of cover it into a shell and you become more careful about, you know, what you do and how you reach out to others. Um, but these days, uh, I realized, you know what, I need to own this part. I need to come back to that desire that I had ever since I was a kid and just let it loose, just like care about everyone 110%. And, you know, I, I learned my lessons. I kind of learned how not to, you know, get tricked as much or get or, or get hurt as much as I used to, as I, as I did. So I, you know, I'm more cautious. I'm more aware of, of what mistakes not to do. I'm sure I will do many more still, but, but now I have more intelligence to how to be that caring and giving person. And that's kind of this journey, this channel is all about, but I kind of jumped to the end and let's make sure we don't, don't skip too many parts and let's come back a bit back into the past. So I was a creative, uh, empathetic, empathetic, I guess that's how we pronounce it, child and, uh, very caring and. Uh, the problem was I was growing up in a rough city. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, crimes, a lot of violence. My friends were got beaten up all the time. I have this covered in some other videos, so I won't go into detail in that. But, but I think that made me even more caring because I would, I would question, so why do people do this? Why is this happening? And what could I do about that? That later helped me resonate actually with the character of Batman because, you know, Gotham, if you know the mythology. Uh, then I discovered Aikido when I was 14. A friend of mine invited me to try out Aikido and I was already in love with the Japanese culture, especially the samurai culture. I loved the movie The Last Samurai. And uh, I always was intrigued about martial arts but never really trained one. But then my friend invited me to try out Aikido and from the first time I saw it, I was like, this is perfect for me. You know, they have the swords, which I love. And I was a very peaceful kid. I, I didn't like violence and Aikido was promising to give you a martial art which 
is peaceful, which where you don't use violence to protect uh, yourself and others, and it's all about protecting. So I was like, this is just perfect for me. And also there were hakamas, the fancy Aikido pants that you see them wearing, which I was like, I was like, I want one. Thing is, you have to earn one. In Aikido, they don't give it to you until you get like close to a black belt. So, so I, I earned it, but that also kind of motivated me. So there were so many things which fell into place, and and uh, I really liked Aikido. I really liked training it, and uh, I so I started when I was 14, just just turned 14. Uh, there's a, kind of a significant point in my life that happened too. Is my dad had a stroke, actually doing that kind of around that time and now that I think back about it uh, I do sometimes talk about it but I feel that really made me more thoughtful because uh, while I was a timid shy child uh, around when I was uh, 12 I actually started becoming much more open and I started hanging out with the cool kids we would smoke I started smoking when I was 12 we would drink alcohol a lot I was the the one who drank most yeah <laughs> so yeah and uh, and so I was hanging out with them partying I was the youngest kid with them but I kind of I guess I was a bit more mature for my age so they really liked me I was called my nickname was demon I would always wear sunglasses day night I have this kind of character so so the kids really liked me and and I kind of became party of the soul I started uh, I started also doing theater in school I, I, I got main roles it's a whole funny story in its own, but but I kind of really opened up and uh, but I think when my dad had a stroke and he survived and you know, he's still around and, and everything and it's a great story about that 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 it turned out so good. But now that I look back, I think it actually made me think about life a bit more. I think that kind of that experience that being exposed to that that made me realize somewhere inside that life is unpredictable and it's short it was a direct experience because i saw him uh, how he crumbled i actually remember that day really well uh, he was my dad is very athletic he's training every day for like last like 30 years or something and uh, doesn't skip one day ever besides the moment where he was recovering from the stroke <laughs> but then he was training and and uh, and he came into the room and he couldn't talk you know, and uh, and I saw that I was like, what the fuck? And I was, I guess, I was too young. I was, I was, uh, I think I was 13, just before I started Aikido, you know, I guess, or or just yeah. Anyway, well, I was, I still didn't really cope and understand what what the heck is happening, but I saw him, you know, there and the ambulance taking him away and and kind of went through that. And while I didn't recognize that at the time, I realized that that made me realize that life is short and that's actually one of the core um, kind of core parts of my value system of my of what drives me to this day I keep reminding myself and I, I like to remind myself that life is short that it's it can be way shorter than you think and uh, and it's something I, I, I keep making sure that I would address and remember. Uh, sometimes I ask, uh, not anymore actually, but for a while I used to ask very constantly. So if I would have one year to live, what I would do. And I lived like that for a while. I think I just kind of became used to living like that. So I don't need to actually even ask that anymore. But at that moment, uh, yeah, I realized life is fragile. And I think it's such a great gift it's, it's something actually <clears throat> i read once when i was into aikido and i read all the possible books about it there's one aikido instructor who said that specifically and, and it's a thought i liked he said that death is the greatest gift that human beings have and the way he justified that argumented it he said that because you know that life is fleetile that life is, is can end any time that you will die one day that makes you appreciate it more and strive to do more during that life. But um, but if life would be endless, that's kind of what vampire movies sometimes look at, then you kind of become numb and you don't care about anything because you're like, 
it's going forever. And I don't necessarily know or think if that's that would be like that, but but I I, I kind of resonated with that idea. And I thought it's there's some truth to it. And I, I do remember remind myself even these days sometimes like life is you know we we all feel like we're we are the hero of our story and to a degree we are but the, the 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 deal is we all most of us feel like we are the center of the world which is false you know we all feel like the world is about me and that you know death is for others other people die you know, I won't die. Unless you're exposed to death, like you work at, at a place where death is a common part of it. In the Western society, we kind of try to dim down the, the knowledge of death. You know, there's, like in India, you can find sea corpses on the street. Or there's a place where they burn corpses all day long, and you can come in as a tourist and watch. And so death is not, it's really kind of part of life there. In the West, you know, we really try to kind of pretend like death doesn't exist. We don't talk about death much. And, and I think that's, I guess we are trying to make ourselves feel more comfortable. But at the same time, um, that we, we lose that gift of, of death in that way. And to make sure that I, I, I'm, I'm stay conscious about that, I do sometimes stop. And even like a couple days ago, I did. I stopped, I looked at you know, the sky and, and the stars, and I thought, oh, shit, you know, this is, this is not going to last forever. Yeah, let's drink some coffee. <laughs> but yeah, and I think some people, you know, they, they live like they would live forever. And uh, they're like, oh, I'm going to do what I really want to do sometime later. And, you know, doing what you want to do is not that easy. I'm planning to address that more as we go into the future because, you know, I've, I was able to successfully start off a number of projects of uh, living by doing what I personally want to do. And it's a, it's a lot of work. It's way more work than people sometimes think, especially, I guess, the millenniums. But, you know, that's a subject for another day. But, but yeah, I think embracing that knowledge that life is futile that you think you're gonna live until 90 or 100, but to realize that actually any day could be your last one, it's a scary thought, of course, my goodness. But when you realize it, you suddenly start to appreciate things more and you realize, I don't maybe, I don't maybe have as much time as I think. So I should start you know, thinking more and how I want to spend my time. And, and to come back to my own story, um, so yeah, I guess that exposure uh, to that situation, my dad having a stroke, uh, kind of made that clear to me and 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 I think I started to reflect about that often and I would think man I don't know how much I will live so I really need to make sure because I always cared about the world and now I understood that life can be short life is life is short and it can be even shorter than you think I really need to push hard and, and make sure that I do something significant that if I really want to have a positive impact on the world I need to work my ass off and not waste time and and that's where I actually kind of closed down in on myself I started pushing away my friends or most of them especially the the cool kids they got into drugs and I didn't I didn't want to go into drugs especially at that time you know it was way too early to try out drugs and, and a lot of them you know went through hard shit because of the drugs uh, so I didn't. I'm happy. I pushed that away. Uh, but I also kind of excluded myself and, and kind of became even more thoughtful, started reading books. And and then the whole period went for uh, me deciding what I will do after high school, which is a tough period, but that's covered in, in, in a different video. But yeah, and then I realized I wanted to become an Aikido instructor. So I devoted myself entirely to reading books and, and practicing as much as I can watching all the possible videos about it. So, so I kind of intuitively understood that I will be as valuable as much as value I will possess, you know, as much as I will know and be able to do. That eventually led me to Switzerland to live in a martial arts slash spiritual school. And I think that that was kind of also driven by the knowledge that one day I will die. And if I really want to become good, I need to fully kind of immerse myself in the learning process. So living in a, in a martial arts school was ideal for me at the day. 
and it kind of worked out. It, it did help me achieve my goals. Uh, I think actually I kind of had that quality, that quality of, of life being fleetile and, and me wanting to contribute to the world continue to, to lead me. And so when I opened my Aikido school, my Aikido dojo, my Aikido meditation yoga, uh, there's part of, part of me I always tried to teach, each time I would teach the best class possible. That was part of my methodology. And it's a, t it's a tough one. I don't necessarily recommend it, but, but that was my, my way to go. I, I would, each time I would try to teach the best class possible. And because I felt like, you know, I, who knows how much I can, I will be able to give. Um, so I was really d head into the whole school and I was really engaging my community and, and trying to change their lives. Now, again, this is covered in another video, you know, how eventually that part of that made me lose most of my students. And I took some wrong decisions. I made some wrong decisions. I copied the wrong things from my keto instructor and... And you know, I was too young as well, and didn't know many things that uh, would would have been useful. Uh, and then I lost a lot of my Aikido students. That was painful. That hurt me. But then I started recovering. I started getting some students back, and uh, that's when I started my Aikido channel. It initially, was a YouTube Aikido channel. I started putting out tutorials, Aikido tutorials, and I, I turned to be turned out to be good. So I was running my dojo and simultaneously at the side, like as a hobby, I was running my YouTube channel. And early enough, I, I noticed, I looked at it and I was like, holy crap, this is gonna be big. I will, I will be able to sustain myself financially by this and I will have a huge impact through, through this channel. And uh, back then I was married uh, I got married in 2012. Oh wait, no. Okay, I met my. Pro uh, I, long story for another day. Uh, I, uh, I I I started living with my ex partner in 2012, and I think we got married in 2014. But we were engaged from the first year. So uh, yeah, so I was already living with my partner. Probably we were already married when I started my YouTube channel. And uh, I, uh, I, uh, she, she actually encouraged me to start the YouTube channel initially, and then I saw the potential in it. And uh, one day I approach her and I'm like, you know what? This is gonna be huge. Like, you know, this is like, we're gonna, this is gonna be our main financial base, and and I will, I will be able to reach out, reach so many people, and have impact on so many people through this channel. It's like it's gonna be amazing. And that was like, you know, I had like, I don't know, 200 subscribers, you know, a few thousand views, but I could see that. And she looked at me, she's like, Rokas, you're crazy. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? And she didn't, she didn't believe me. She was like, you're talking nonsense. Like, what the heck are you, what, where are you, where are you coming up with this from? But I could see it. I could feel it in my gut. This is going to be amazing. And so I continued to pursue YouTube more and more. It started to take more and more of my life. And I started to look on how I can provide value through YouTube as I was running my dojo. And uh, there was this funny moment with my ex. Uh, she, she, because I kept telling her, this is gonna be big, this is gonna be big, and she, she, got, she got tired of it, and she told me, okay, when you're gonna earn 400 euros from your YouTube videos, then I will tell you, okay, you were right. And I will, you know, I will never say your, this is nonsense to you anymore. I was like, okay, no problem. About six or eight months later, I earned that was 400 euros. And she's like, no, actually I said three months. If you earn for three months, 400 euros in a row, then I will, you know, say you're right. I was like, okay. And eventually that happens. <laughs> and uh, there was this funny moment where my ex, she was complaining to my parents, kind of in a funny way, you know, but she's like, you know, I can't say, when Rokas comes up with some nonsense and tells me that this is gonna happen, and I think, what, what the heck is he thinking about? And he makes it happen. Uh, he, not, he doesn't make it happen, but when I come to her and I tell her that, and she thinks I'm crazy, she's complaining to my parents that she can't, uh, can't tell me that I'm crazy because now she's, she's thinking, maybe he will make it happen, although I don't even believe in him. And my mom laughs and I'm sitting there too, and she's like, oh, we're already used to that. I'm like, what do you mean, mom? And she's like, well, anytime, any, anytime Rokas comes and tells us something crazy he's planning to do, which sounds like impossible, and we think it's impossible, we tell him, yeah, yeah, go ahead, honey, it's gonna be great. Uh, and and so, so the idea was like, 
they don't necessarily believe me, but they, they saw me prove them wrong so many times in those big projects that they're like, they're, she was laughing and saying that, you know, that they don't say that I'm crazy anymore because there's a big chance I actually will prove the impossible to be possible. And I look at my mom and, she's, and I'm like, and I thought you always believed in me. Turns out, you know, you have those doubts, but you just, you, you're just used to not saying no anymore because, you know, I can prove them wrong. It was a funny moment. But anyway, so I saw the potential in YouTube and uh, I made my Aikido YouTube channel become uh, one of the three biggest YouTube channels in the world. Not YouTube, sorry, Aikido YouTube channels, Aikido channels uh, in the world. So it was a big thing. A lot of Aikido people knew me. I became kind of famous in Aikido. People started inviting me and uh, they started inviting me into their own dojo. I taught a seminar in Germany and I was invited to teach a seminar in France and more and more of those discussions came but then I filmed a crucial video in my life, Aikido Rush's MMA which made me question my, my martial arts and I realized it's an important subject so I started covering that subject then the Aikido world started hating me and they disowned me, most of them that was a, a tough period, then I separated with my Aikido instructor pretty much due to that as well and that was a tough experience as well uh, but I lived through it and I kept developing my martial arts journey channel and eventually that led me to closing my dojo, moving to the States for uh, about six, seven months. Uh, I devoted myself to a full-on uh, mixed martial arts program, MMA, which at the end of I had a mixed martial arts fight, and um, which was great because it was on my bucket list. And again, it was kind of the same approach. If you want to learn something completely, you know, dive head deep into it and that's what I did for six months I was just training every day for you know a few a couple of times per day uh, so that was a great amazing journey and my martial arts journey channel reached 100,000 subscribers I, I, I eventually started making my living off of it all my money came from it still still does most of my money comes from that channel uh, then I moved to Ireland, where I trained with uh, one of the best-known mixed martial arts instructors, coaches, John Kavanagh, uh, who is, you know, I, I hate to say this part, but I guess it's inevitable to say, but, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's also known for being the coach of Conor McGregor, but not that it's, you know, not that that's most important. The thing is, John is just an amazing human being and, and a coach. And I feel, I feel such a great privilege that I had a chance to, to spend time with him because I was, I was uh, helping him out by filming videos for him and training uh, for him, uh, training with him. And uh, so I had a, uh, a lot of time to spend with him and talk with him and he's just amazing. You know, Conor McGregor, he's amazing too, but uh, I think, you know, some people sometimes focus too much about the, the part of Coach John Kavanaugh you know, being the coach of Conor McGregor and they, they kind of dismiss everything, the, the huge other things he has achieved in his life. So, so I would like to focus more on that actually. But yeah, so that was a great experience. Uh, but eventually after a few months of living in Dublin, I came back to Lithuania. Uh, I got divorced <laughs> during that time, by the way. That was a thing on its own. And uh, I discovered, I found a... a new lady, a different lady in my life, and I'm very happy about that. She's a wonderful woman. Uh, now I, uh, you know, we are in a relationship for almost a year now, which is super cool. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in the future as well. But then when I came back uh, to spend time with her in Lithuania, and I moved back to Lithuania, uh, I realized I kind of burnt myself out uh, from martial arts, and I realized, like, it's not satisfying anymore. I started feeling like I did share the main pointers, I did tell the main things about martial arts that I wanted to, I did tell my story about martial arts and that impacted a lot of people so I'm very happy about that. Like one of the best moments for me was when I would see someone writing me a comment, oh you inspired me, your martial arts journey inspired me and I was like, oh, for me it's all about that. But then I started to feel like I'm only reaching people who are doing martial arts. And that frustrated me. I was like, I need to, you know, I, I, as long as I'm alive, I need to make sure I have the most biggest possible positive impact on the world as I can. And that led me to a, 
realization that I need to expand my journey. And I need to make sure because I wasn't, I, I was never just about martial arts. Martial arts was a vehicle for me, but I also did so many other things. You know, I, I, I spent so much time learning to meditate and you know, I did yoga and I did all those crazy projects. Um, I did a lot and, uh, and none of that is covered in the martial arts journey and, and I can't cover it there because um, people are not gonna, people who are subscribed on the martial arts journey channel, they're not very interested in what else I do. It's, it's just, you know, they expect martial arts there. It's, you know, that's the name. And so I tried pushing some of my stuff outside of martial arts into that channel, but it wasn't really accepted. I did some mistakes, core mistakes myself, how I approached that. But eventually, long story short, that led me to open up a new channel, which is this channel. And it was a whole journey of discovering. It was like a difficult, challenging beginning. Long story, I'll, I'll cover it in different videos why, but... But yeah, and, and I had to rediscover my voice. I was like asking myself, I was kept asking myself, so how can I really deliver most value to people? And the latest thing I discovered is videos like this. Just being completely honest with you, sharing my story. And that's, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's just one of the parts. I have a vision how I will expand later from it. But there are valuable lessons I learned the hard way which I feel uh, that me sharing my story uh, honestly and learning my, uh, sharing about my uh, failures and successes and insights that they may benefit, that may benefit other people, hopefully prevent them from making the same mistakes or become more, you know, intelligent through this way. So, so that's what I'm focusing on right now, publishing my main stories, which I feel can be valuable to people. Uh, but my main goal that I want to go to is, uh, I even wrote it down as a phrase on one of my des desktops, but basically the biggest vision I would have, the biggest dream I have that I would want to, want to accomplish while I am alive is to create a movement, uh, a culture of people who are completely devoted to becoming the best possible versions of themselves who are always constantly working themselves to improve for the better of everyone else and their own as well. Let's not forget ourselves. You know, I'm, I'm all about that. You have to live a life that you enjoy yourself, but also you have to live a life that is valuable to everyone. And uh, I know that not a lot of people do that. Not like, and, and I could, you know, talk forever about that and probably I will. Why is that in my experience? Why, why we are so focused on our own story. We're so protective and, and we don't spend, most of us don't spend so much time being concerned about others, especially people we don't like, for example. But I, I would like to inspire as many people as I can to make that shift and to consider everyone else more than they do today and become the best possible versions of themselves so that they would enrich the world. And I feel that that's a great way to, to also live a life where you're happy. It's also a bit of a stressful life, but also it's also demanding and it's important to maintain balance in it that's my experience uh, I have to make sure always that I make sure that I don't burn myself out and I'm gonna make a video about that <laughs> but that being said that's that's my biggest aim I would love to create a movement a culture of people devoted to becoming their best possible selves owning their shit being open honest vulnerable hardworking happy and also devoted to make this world a better place. It's 34 minutes, a good time to wrap up. We'll continue other videos, but I hope that by watching this video, you got a better feel for who am I, what I'm about, and I hope we will continue this journey together. Thank you.